Okay, I think that we are saying it right. Yeah. Okay. So, and it, it is so exciting to learn from children. Um, basically, in I became a teacher in 1979, and, and my PhD I earned it um, 2000, in the year 2000. And one thing that uh, uh, has kept my interest and my excitement in education is my interactions with children with, and with students, from little kids to graduate students, um, because there is so much to learn from young kids. Um, they are brilliant. And I am talking about kids from all communities, especially kids from working class communities and communities living on the, on the poverty you? level. No? Yes. And um, so I want to share with you uh, the work uh, that I uh, did a few years ago here in New York City with uh, two bilingual schools um, on providing opportunities for uh, the children uh, to engage with uh, science practices and to uh, create a context for the use of their uh, LOTI, which we call the language other than English. So the, the two schools, the kids were bilingual in Spanish and English in one of the schools, and in the other, Mandarin and English. And I invited a colleague of mine who is Chinese, of Chinese background, of Taiwanese background, more exactly, to participate in the project, and she uh, accepted. And uh, we engage working with bilingual uh, teacher candidates and bilingual children in this after school program. When we talk about expansive learning, we are referring to, um, to a framework that invites us to move from this view of learning as a, as a simple input and output process, um, a skill-based orientation, um, move away from prescriptivist perspective on language, that is that there is one correct way of speaking a language and that's the one that counts, and that there are some languages that count more than others. And a, a focus, mostly and exclusively on the individual and what is going on their mind um, without attention to the complexities of learning and the social context that mediate individual learning. And uh, when we talk about expansive learning, we are thinking of a theory that invites us to have an orientation to the future which is think of that learning which is not yet there, which is very Vygotskian. Um, that means that yes, we live the present, but we don't stay so much assessing what students know all the time. We create opportunities for new learning, learning which is not yet there, and um, learning that requires imagination. What Maxine Green, uh, invite us to use and to create our social imagination, or what Ellen Duckworth talked about the having of wonderful ideas. So it is the context looking at what is to what is possible, and not so much of to what is what we already know or what we don't know. It is an orientation to the future. And it is a process through which learners construct a new concept for their collective activity, a new concept of what it means to become bilingual, what it means to become a scientist, what it means to become a mathematician. So what does it mean to teach bilingual learners? This is the new object or motive or concept of the activity. And expansive learning invites us to reconceptualize it. It is just more than developing skills. And skills are good, strategies are much better, 
but it is about reconceptualizing things and engaging in, in activity, in practice. It is also, yes, grounded on the individual learning, but opening up to horizontal learning. So it is not just vertical learning. It is learning through interactions, learning from each other, developing collective uh, knowledge. With an awareness that individuals are the ones who can transform their activities and learners, students, teachers engage in transformative work are the ones who can do the work in a collective way. So we cannot do it for the learner, but we need to create and orchestrate an environment in which learners can take ownership of their own learning. So centering students would be a must in this uh, theoretical perspective, not so much centering a curricula that you need to follow and to be a really faithful to that program. It is not about following a program to the team. It is about centering students. Programs and curricula are important, but sometimes they and the standardized tests become the object and the motive of the activity. And we want to shift that to center again the learning that we have in our classroom, to center the linguistic and the cultural resources or what Luis Mon and colleagues call the funds of knowledge, which would turn into a process of decolonizing and relocating knowledge bringing knowledge from the communities to the center of the curriculum so that we can bridge the content knowledge that we want to secure as a school, but also uh, making it really culturally relevant and taking into account the knowledge of the community. And for Luis Mol uh, and for Vygotsky, uh, Luis Mol citing Vygotsky, the environment is the source of development and not its setting. So it is not a matter of changing the setting. It is that when children are in our classrooms, that environment, the interactions that take place there, the mediation and means and tools that we offer, the languages that are disposed at, 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 at kids' dispose, disposition, uh, uh, they are the ones, the, the source of development, and they push development forward. So in, in a few words, we see bilingual education as advocacy and transformative work. Um, that, is, that involves a, an awareness that we need to situate bilingual education within some historical tension so that the harmony can be materialized. And those historical tensions is to acknowledge issues of equity. Why did bilingual education emerge in the first place and who is benefiting from bilingual education? It is to uh, examine ourselves and our language ideologies and be aware that English only ideologies are really, really dominant, sometimes even in bilingual context. And uh, views of language uh, guided by prescriptivism versus heteroglossic ideologies, they are in tension, and we need to think about that. Um, also, translanguaging, which uh, uh, invites us to consider the whole linguistic repertoire of the students. We need to bring it again center into the classroom, but also at the same time, while broadening students' linguistic competences and disciplinary by literacy in STEM or in whatever uh, discipline we want to, to support them. And communities and parents have expectations about the languages that they want for the children to develop. So we need to harmonize translanguaging with quality and sustain and extend that interaction with the targeted languages. Um, part of the historical tensions and contradictions are the low expectations that in general society has towards kids from working class families and for families living, uh, living in poverty levels. And it, these are things that we need to watch ourselves, right? Uh, sometimes we should record our discussions and our meetings to see how we talk about the children that come to our classroom, especially those bilingual kids from minoritized communities. 
because what happens is that then those deficit perspectives and low expectations will lead us to a, have assimilationist perspective in the classroom a, instead of culturally sustainable perspective. And one of the uh, tensions uh, that I want to address today is balancing the attention to disciplinary learning, to concepts, and also to language. How can we do both? Because that is what bilingual education is about. So today, I hope that I can share with you some ideas, um, the students' work that invite us to consider that language learning can be promoted as emerging bilingual students engage in science practices, while at the same time, content or disciplinary learning can be facilitated through the use of more than one language, through multimodal literacy, through an inquiry curriculum, through the integration of community forms of knowledge, and through horizontal learning. So both things can happen. We don't need to wait until children have language proficiency to start engaging them with thoughtful disciplinary learning and content. And the curriculum that we offer the children for three months was organized around some standards from the next generation science standards. And we chose the topic of independent relationships in ecosystem, environmental impacts on organisms. We wanted to engage the children on the science practices that come with this uh, standard uh, around the question, what happens to organisms when their environment changes? So, we wanted for the children to start constructing arguments that some animals form groups for whatever reason, and evidence about particular habitats for some organisms, and being able to make a claim to propose a problem and solution. And those uh, uh, science practices involve asking questions. So, you know, most of the time we are the ones asking the questions to the kids and they are the ones who complete and search for the answers. But we want for the children to be problem posers, afraid uh, invited us, uh, that they ask their own questions. Of course, we have ours and we provide them also. But if we don't incorporate the students' curiosity and questions, then uh, uh, the learning process, uh, you know, will be a short process and a very limited process and the students' engagement. So we wanted for them to select an animal that they were interested in learning about or that they identify with that animal. Um, and so to start learning about it and to start investigating. The students engage in analyzing and interpreting data and constructing explanations constructing arguments and designing habitats for their children, for their animals, sorry. And uh, we must also to discuss uh, problems and solutions to environmental uh, issues and tensions. This is just an example of this first session. I want to highlight here how we integrate a game and play. These were third bilingual graders. And uh, the main activity, the one in yellow, classification of animals activity, it was such a powerful activity because the students were organized in, on tables of five students, three to five students per table. And we provided them with a set of animal cards. And we invited them to organize those animal cards in whatever way that makes sense to them, which animals go together with which. And uh, they could form their groups of animals and explain their thinking. And that was a very powerful activity. Oh, like and yes. And then at the end, uh, they, at the end of that session, they will choose the animal that they wanted to investigate. So in this case, Ada chose the turtle. So she wanted to learn more about the turtle and why did she uh, choose the turtle? 
So I like the turtle because they are slow and they take their time. And I like to take my time as the turtle. So Ada is a girl that you don't want to rush. So she likes to take her time doing things and she identifies with the turtle. So right from the beginning, you have choice on the part of the students. They could choose. It is relevant to them. Uh, they are bringing the, the cultural resources from the communities, as we will see a little bit later, and they are working on their forms of identities. They are sharing with us a little bit of who they are in those decisions that they make. And we get to know them as persons, not only just as learners. So this is the activity of the classification of cards, and the students uh, uh, had different uh, opinions and they had to negotiate meanings um, and an example of horizontal learning. And this is just an example of one of the discussions. So Anton uh, proposes that uh, the dogs uh, could go in one place, they are organizing uh, some animals and uh, and, and the birds, those that fly. Um, and then uh, he says, well, the horses have four legs as the dogs and they run and the dogs also run. So he started playing with some types of grouping and uh, in terms of language, they are helping each other. Uh, Como se llama owner in Spanish? How do you say owner? And so he adds a new category, uh, which is that some animals have owners. So he starts uh, grouping with their classmates, some animals based on that criteria. Um, but then uh, the students started inserting their personal studies. And this was a space in which this uh, child, um, Mimi, shared how she went to the river and then uh, they brought international knowledge to the discussion because they brought the topic of balls. And uh, so she told a quick story on uh, how she put herself first when the balls appeared uh, so that her sister uh, was safe, in a way presenting herself as this girl with agency and with power to protect her sister showing a little bit of themselves and bringing uh, international uh, experiences to the to the discussion. So we move, uh, uh, I want to add that their classifications were at the beginning very basic uh, in terms of size of animals and their interactions moved them to consider other categories and we wanted to see what they what they will come up so that we could take that information into account. And then uh, we invited them to create uh, representations of their animals using clay that took two weeks. Because that activity uh, was an invitation to consider the characteristics of their animals, it would come handy later to study how uh, they eat, uh, uh, and um, another aspect of the animal. And I want to share with you an example of the power of multimodality. And uh, these uh, occur uh, at, a, at a different, uh, in the Chinese context and in a different topic, still science related, but uh, the child, Hao Hao, was creating a multimodal text that involved a uh, clay art. And he, um, he, the teacher and the preserved teacher invited them to develop a landscape, to represent a landscape. And they took a photo of the landscape that they created and inserted it into comic life, created a multimodal text. And this is the discussion that took place around this representation. The teacher candidate says, when I came to Hao Hao, he was creating the, the, the Buddha's hand. Sorry, I am, I am part of the text is covered by my screen window. So anyway, 
uh, the teacher was helping other Chinese language learners typing Chinese words. She saw how, how uh, who wrote, this is giant hand under his imaginary land picture. At that time, this caption is quite a topic for me. Therefore, I started to ask how how about his imaginary land and initiated a conversation involving his PR design. So the teacher candidate is walking through the tables and she notices this uh, uh, clay representation and she thinks that it is quite a topic for her. So then she goes to the child and starts talking and asking him about his work. The teacher candidate says, how, how, what did you create? And the son, the peer said, he didn't create the landscape, he made a hand. Why did you make a hand? The kid says, this is a giant hand. So he was busy choosing template, talking with a looking at, at the teacher candidate. Why do you think a giant hand is a landscape? It is Buddha's magic palm, says the kid. He was suddenly excited doing the gesture to demonstrate Buddha's palm, looking at me eagerly and hoping I could understand his thoughts. What is Buddha's magic palm as his fear? And then he said again with impatience, it is a giant hand, and this time in English, just in case they were not understanding him. Oh, I see, says the teacher candidate. You have created a five-finger mountain from the book Journey to the West. Buddha turned his five fingers into a huge mountain to lock Monkey King off. And the kid says, yes, five-finger mountain. And uh, this a story is part of the literacy practices of uh, uh, many Chinese communities. Uh, we uh, talked to the mother later through an interview and the mother told how much, how, how loved this story and that every time that a new person came to visit the home, he had to tell the story and the mother invited him to tell the story of Monkey King because it is a, a, a very culturally relevant story that even Chinese American students here in New York, uh, are, most of them are familiar, or many of them are familiar. So this cultural uh, uh, connection would have been missed uh, had the teacher candidate not known about this. So she shared part of her cultural background. And for those of us who don't share the cultural background of the kids, it is important that we still ask and that we share the question with the class because they may know and others can also support this kind of mediation instead of jumping first to assume that it is quite a topic what the kids are doing. So we see here the literacy practices um, coming into place into an official event at school and mediating science learning for a child. We also use extensive children's literature, expository text, digital text. Uh, we use a lot of the internet also to find expository text. And some of the books had language accessibility or visual accessibility as Bardell and colleagues invite us to think about for learners of English or learners of a new language, uh, or they had a content accessibility um, and accessibility of organization in the text. Not all the books had all those characteristics, but uh, they mediated different things. And we tried to provide a strong text in the language other than English so that the kids could engage with uh, the specific language that goes with science uh, um, thinking. Um, the children also were invited to, to evaluate information and to communicate information. So they were, in this case, they were talking about penguins and how penguins uh, 
uh, have babies by means of X, says Billy. And he says, I know, I knew that, right? And then uh, they are engaging with the um, specialized types of languages that we wanted, right? With the academic type of science language. So they use the terms uh, of viparose, by viparose, and, um, and they also were able to bring their own questions. So he asked, ¿A poco el papá y la mamá tiene un huevo? So this is a curiosity. It is, do the father and the mother both lay eggs? But the translation doesn't make justice to the tone of the question because ¿A poco? Means that you telling me that the father and the mother both lay eggs? Really? Um, and then the teacher invites him to read a section of a text that the teacher uh, helped him to identify. And then the kid read how they lay the egg and the mom needs to eat and she gives the egg to the male who holds it between his legs. And so they engage in this type of discussions and language that uh, extended what they initially thought. Uh, one of the girls shows the penguins because they are just funny. They walk funny in a funny way, uh, but also because they swim in the water and they have babies. They organize their information and share it in different ways. Uh, they engage in research using text, using iPads, all what we were able to provide. And then we also provided some templates to think of different aspects of the research that we wanted to support for them. And they, as uh, they learned about it, they completed it. At this point, we were not looking for accuracy in the writing, just for their ideas to put them down. You know, editing has a place, but it is not when they are uh, playing with emergent ideas. We want to support that thinking without concerns on, of accuracy. And we want to support their language without concerns of pronunciation. It is their ideas that we want to capture first, and then we can deal with the rest at some point, right, through mini lessons. But we cannot stop a child who is writing something that doesn't look standard to correct him while he's producing and engaging with an idea. Um, this is just a, a second example and last example of the lessons that we organized. In this case, we wanted to focus on inter and intra species. And we came again to use animal cars because it was a very powerful activity. And we wanted to, to facilitate their thinking about uh, relationships uh, between, among animals. We included culturally relevant songs for the children and literature. And the focus this time by this week was on food and on being a prey or predator. So we provided, this is one of the images that we provided. And the kids engaged one of the groups in the following discussion. So one of the kids says, when the lions talk, so they, the deers, go in groups. So if it is one lion, and then the teacher candidate supports so his thinking, what would it do with that group of deers? Hunt them. Oh, yes. And they are together as a group because the lion will have more the teacher candidates complete, helps him more chance to hunt, but they and run, so they run. Um, one of the girls says, um, no, it, it is not just for that. I say that they are together because they are fighting over food. So uh, the, 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 the children in this context that is so open, but still it is well orchestrated, can't uh, share their different uh, hypotheses and their different interpretations of the situation. But then Jaller asks at the end of what is the food? You know, there is no food in that illustration. There is no evidence. And that kept the discussion moving on. We moved then later to a discussion of ecosystems in their communities and we provided them with cameras so that they could take photos and then we received the cameras back and then we brought the photos for them. 
and we gave them the photos uh, by groups and asked them to organize them by, by habitat. And we invited them to think of New York City as an urban ecosystem. And this activity was important because they were taking photos from their homes, habitats in their homes and their communities in the blocks, in the parks. And there was an interesting case of a child who didn't, couldn't, or didn't, I don't know, uh, it couldn't photograph a real habitat. So he and his mom sat and took a magazine and <laughs> cut out a habitat and brought those. So, you know, which is a way of participating, even if it was not a, exactly the expectation, but he contributed his, his ideas to the group. This is in the Chinese context. And then we wanted to call attention to environmental issues at the end and to help them consider um, some problems and solutions. Um, basically focusing on air pollution, water pollution, sound pollution, littering, deforestation. And we organized the group by one of these and they uh, investigated, a little, investigated a little bit and shared their ideas of what we could do to take care of our environment and what others to do. So I wanted to do a, an analysis of how language was used. And this is a very simple analysis, a very raw, uh, but I wanted to observe um, how much English and how much Spanish and how much translanguaging has happened in the, in the, in the course. And, uh, we can see here that 50% of the conversational tense, which was what I selected as the unit of analysis of their group work, uh, they stayed uh, within their conversational terms in Spanish. And 43% of their conversational terms were fully in English. And a, a minimum of the conversational terms have the two languages within the same conversational terms. But in a conversation, we have this distribution of Spanish and English, a little bit more of Spanish, which we work so hard to provide a materials and resources to engage them in using it. And uh, we can see that two Spanish dominant students contributed a lot of Spanish to their interactions. And two English dominant students um, one of them or two of them second language learners of Spanish contributed the most English, but still they engage with Spanish. And we have about two or three students who uh, move uh, so fluidly between the two languages all the time. So this represents uh, more or less what happened with the, with the whole group of 13 students. So we can see that the students use their full linguistic resources to participate in the event. And the, the, the program had the intention of strengthening their use of Spanish or under use of Mandarin uh, to engage in academic language learning and disciplinary learning and language learning in that target language. And still uh, we see that uh, if you look at, at the activities in which they use language, I noticed that those activities that had more content in terms of disciplinary learning were the ones that supported more their Spanish use because they had text to look at and the language of the text helped them to incorporate also uh, into their own language. Uh, while the activity that was more creative, like creating their animals out of clay, in which they were really colloquial, talking to each other, how are you doing, etc., uh, they moved back and forth uh, between the two. And, and of course, the wiki space, because they were sharing information, it has a lot of use of Spanish. 
But um, what I want to highlight here is that we need to, uh, I mean, we learned, right, a, how the students use whatever linguistic resources they have, but we still need to provide the best materials and activities and engagement that we can to support their engagement with the targeted language, because that is the goal of a dual language program. We want to broaden their students' language repertoire, not only accept what they are bringing and accept the, the, the language practices in their communities, but as a school and a program, we want to broaden those, to extend those. And we need to, to think about that, especially in, in dual language programs, there is a reason why uh, uh, some schools and some programs and some teachers have a clear intention of fostering a targeted language within that time and the other within a different time. And yes, separation of languages may seem like crazy uh, for communities in which they just move so fluidly between the two. But at the end of the day, it is part of the goal of dual language programs to provide that exposure and that extension on the use of a targeted language. Because what I have learned through my work with children in classrooms is that um, if you uh, don't create those expectations of using the targeted language, uh, the language that will dominate the discussion will be English all the translanguaging will be towards English. And that is in dual language classrooms. Of course, an English general classroom where you have multiple languages in which you don't know the language. Um, ideally, we need, no matter the, the, our bilingualism, to show this uh, admiration for the multiple languages and varieties of languages that we have in the classroom, whether it is, it is Mixteco, uh, African-American vernacular, um, a Spanish from I don't know where, from different places, uh, whatever the language, if, especially if the language is spoken by a minoritized group, we need to show that, um, that admiration and invite them to bring it into the classroom in some way. And when they are working in group, to use it if there are other speakers that speak the same language. So we can still provide the context even if we are not so bilingual. So translanguage in those cases is super important and, and needed if the students uh, have support from other peers, if you don't speak their language. So, you know, it is a, a, it is a, there is a tension in the field regarding how to, a, 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 foster translanguaging in the classroom, while at the same time uh, supporting disciplinary and language learning uh, in the targeted language. So in, in general, what I wanted to highlight here is that reading and learning in bilingual context are social and cultural achievements. They, they are not just a, an acquisition and development of skills. Skills and strategies are important, but uh, learning a language and learning a discipline is much more than learning just a set of skills. It is a cultural achievement that connects us to social growth within semiotic domains. Uh, it is about thinking, how, how uh, do mathematicians think? How do scientists think? How do writers uh, write? Uh, so we want to, it is about learning a new semiotic domain and not so much learning of specific content. And the content is still important, but much more than the content is the whole semiotic domain. What, what is the type of language that goes around that content, that discipline, that domain? What, what are the, the modes of thinking, the modes of investigating, the modes of writing? So it involves practices that recruit one or more modalities to communicate distinctive types of meaning. So when we say, uh, okay, the kid doesn't know English or doesn't know Spanish or doesn't know Mandarin, we need to say in which context and referring to what domain, to which domain, because they show total proficiency within this domain. 
So what is what we are talking about? There is no such thing as English or Spanish or Mandarin or knowing it or not knowing it because uh, as uh, Hamburger has shown us, uh, by literacy is super complex. There are so many aspects that kids can be super uh, familiar and strong in some aspects and not in others. So the idea of the balanced bilingual is a little bit tricky. What does it mean, uh, right? Um, so we are talking about sharing the particular epistemic frame used within those domains that is thinking as scientists think, for example, and forming new affiliations. And you can see here, and you can see here reflected the the theory of situated learning, which highlights becoming a member uh, of communities of practice and learning through participation, um, learning an identity, right? Becoming a certain type of student, a student that talks about science, that knows where to look for evidence, things like that. Um, I want to to end uh, with uh, the comment from one of our teacher candidates, uh, Eliza. Um, she wrote, I am an expansive learner. Who isn't? But I become frustrated when I am not allowed to expand. Some of my classmates who are teaching now are always saying, these ideas are nice, but how can you do that with the pressures of testing, standards, etc." I understand what they are saying, but as someone who is not in charge or even closely working with the classroom right now, I am troubled by the extent to which these pressures inhibit our own and our students' thinking. So it's right from the start, we are thinking that this cannot be done. Then there is little room for our social imagination, for the development of these wonderful ideas, for uh, making possible new learning. Will we stick with whatever we have and, and new teachers will join whatever it is in school? And what we propose, an expansive learning theory proposes, is that education should not be about adapting. It should be about transforming. So we need to move from a view of education as adaptation to one of transformation. And yes, novice teachers need to learn the, their social cultural environment when they get to any school, but it is important that there is room for the sharing of new ideas and for trying. And what happens is that when the curricula eh, are so tight in terms of requiring teachers to follow the guides to the T, um, there is little room for experimentation or for exploration. If the, the perspective on language is prescriptive, the children are not going to take risks because the children are too smart, they are brilliant and they don't want to, you know, others to make fun of them. So they are not going to take risks if there is only one way of speaking a language, if there is one correct way of reading and writing. And of course, we want to demonstrate the ways of speaking and writing within disciplines, right? The, the mainstream ways of reading and writing, but we need to enable approximations and mediate that, those approximations through demonstrations, through great text, through great conversations, through many opportunities to engage with different forms of writing so that uh, kids can take risks, um, can share a little bit of their brilliance with us, um, so this will be my final invitation. Um, uh, think of bilingual education as an opportunity to create um, and transform uh, our new educational system. So, I think that we may have a, a little bit of time for questions. I don't